Give me what to say Let me hear you Clearly define What I am to do Let every word Penetrate the heart Let what is said Leave them running to your arms Use me Lord Use me Lord If you have your Bibles, turn to with me with, to Luke uh, uh, the 16th chapter in verse 27. Very familiar, very, very familiar. Luke 16th chapter in verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. In verse 28, he says, For I have five brethren that he may testify or witness unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. In verse 29, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They should listen to them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded or convinced, though one rose from the dead. And in the Amplified ver uh, version of uh, verse 31, it says, he said to him, if they do not hear and listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded and convinced. And believe even if someone should rise from the dead. And some versions say, uh, come from among the dead. And my question tonight is, are you persuaded? Are you persuaded? And if so, have you repented? Hmm. And have you truly been changed. Abraham told the rich man that they have Moses and the prophets and to hear them. Listen to what Moses said. Listen to what the prophets said. But you and I have a better covenant. We have someone different that we can listen to. Jesus Christ the righteous. But are we listening to or hearing what God's word is really saying to us? Are we really paying attention to the times and, and are we really listening to what thus saith the Lord or are we making church just a habit? Amen. In Hebrews 8 and 6, he said, how he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. See, no earthly priest could do what Jesus did. No earthly priest, no matter how many or red bulls, how many heifers that they, that they killed, and, and no matter how many goats that they sacrificed, no matter how much blood was poured upon the altar, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He had a far superior ministry than the priesthood under the law of Moses. You know, when the priest went into on the day of atonement and he had on in his garbs and he probably was shaking like Don Knotts because he don't know what the people had done. And he had bales on the bottom of his garments and a rope tied around his ankle. And so if he went in, if, if, if they pulled and they had the bales, they knew that he was OK. Can you imagine if every time we sinned? Every time we made a mistake, if we lived in those days that we would have to atone for it. 
But you and I have a what? Better covenant. Jesus has mediated a a better covenant. He's given us a covenant of grace. It is a covenant of believing and receiving instead of earning and deserving. We're so undeserving of what God did for us. If we look back over our lives, and I, you know, sometimes I, I, I digress to the person that I used to be running the streets and things of that nature. And I know some of you guys, you never ran the streets, amen, but God kept you. And I think that's important, that's just as important as the fact that he saved me from the streets is the fact that he kept you from the streets. He kept you from alcohol. He kept you from drugs. He kept you from multiple men. He kept you from lying and stealing. He kept you. He's a keeper. And the Bible says, yes, he is. Jesus' promises are better for us as it sees us through these dark trials and times and tribulations. And he gives us this undeserved favor. The law came to Moses in Mount Sinai, but the cross was on Mount Zion. So when with the cross and the mountain and, and Moses, it's a totally different thing. Because now we have Jesus Christ. When you look at Luke 16 and 16, it says, until John came, there were the law and the prophets. That's all that they had. Since then, the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone strives violently to go in. We use force his own way rather than God's way into it. We have this thought of this idea that we're going to make it into heaven our own way. Um, I'm going to do things my way. I don't care what the pastor says. I don't care what the elder says. I don't care what the administrative assistant says. I don't care what security says. I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to do this my way. I have a better way of doing this. This speaks about when people try to do things their way, they are letting the enemy use them because they refuse to follow authority. They refuse to listen to what the usher says. When the usher says, just have a seat right here, it's crowded. No, put me in the front row. I watch all the time and I watch the chief and and we know that service starts at 730. It starts at 7.30, am I not right, usually. But usually you see people come in at 8.30 and 8.45 and, and they want a seat up in the front. So, and he's got to move five or six people around because I need to be seen. I just got my new gaiters on and my new suit, so move these people around so I can step up so they can see who I am. That's where we are today. We don't have the sacrifice and the passion in order to make it. Jesus said that I am the way. It's one way into this. The truth and the life. No man, no woman. I don't care what your title is. I don't care what you do. Nobody cometh into the Father but by me. If you don't come through me, there's no other way for you to make it. In Matthew 5 and 17, the Bible says, Jesus says, I think not that I am come, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come, I'm come not to destroy, but to fulfill what was written about me. Oh, God, I wish I could preach in here. Most of the time when we we look at the story of Lazarus and and the rich man, there always tends to be a focus on uh, or leaning towards the, the condition of the rich man and where he is and how he found himself in torments. Some people believe that he is there because he's rich. Uh, some people look at it and say, oh, he, he's, he lived a high life. 
He was bawling out of control, as they say. But that is pure conjecture because the Bible or the book of Luke never says that his riches are what placed him in the position that he found himself in. Am I not correct? Do we ever see where God's word said that the rich man went to hell because he was rich? No, it never said that. This is the only parable and many scholars believe that this is not actually a parable, but a story that Jesus specifically observed and is using as a teaching lesson. And as I was reading, I just kept going back because I knew that it was much more than just seeing a man in torments. It was much more than seeing what happens when you don't live for God. The part of the chapter beginning with a certain rich man. And in the beginning of chapter 16, remember it says a certain man. And it talks about the steward, the ungodly steward. And then it drops down and it speaks of a certain rich man. This is the only time that Jesus has a parable where individuals are given names. He gives Lazarus's name. He gives Abraham's name and he names Moses. Moses. See, the rich man is not given a name, but he is usually called Dives, which is a Latin word for rich or wealthy or, or opulent or someone who's excessively wealthy. No one else, nowhere else in any parable. In any parable of the Gospels, does Jesus give us a name and a specific meaning of the name that is given? Nowhere else. Nowhere else. Lazarus was actually the Greek version of the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means God supports or God helps. And, and I had to look at that again because I know God, Jesus was not a person who just wastes words. There's always a lesson behind what he was trying to show us. It's always something more in the scriptures. If we would take the time out to put our phone down and, and to put the TV set down and just look at the scriptures and what God is trying to show us. He's trying to give us a message here. See, though Lazarus was just a beggar, though Lazarus just desired to eat the dirty bread from the rich man's table, Jesus gave a graphic description of it and said the dogs came and licked his sword. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. But that's why you have to stop being so judgmental about people, because you don't know when people come in here just because they don't look like you, just because they're not churchy like you, just because they don't know scriptures like you do. Just because they might smell a little bit different because they've been on the streets. Just because they might be struggling with alcohol or smell a little bit like weed. We have to make sure that we treat people with love and respect. Because the Bible says it's with love and kindness. Not with love and staring at how you look. It's not with love and looking at your outfit. It's not with love and turning my head when you say hello. It's with love and kindness. Kindness. We've forgotten about kindness. We wonder why people don't get along with us because we ain't kind. We don't speak to folks. We just walk by people. We just ignore people. You have to realize that uh, they don't, quote, act like church folks. I tell this quick story when I used to be over the outreach ministry. Down, I was an assistant down at Greater Grace, and we used to bring the homeless people with us to church on Sunday. We would go minister to them on, on Saturday and ask them if they wanted to come to church, and we would bring them to church with us, and they would sit right with us. 
I don't care what they smelled like. What it, it didn't make any difference. We wanted them to hear the word of God because it's the word of God that will change you. It's the word of God that keeps you from being in the position that they are in. And so they would sit next to us and sometimes they would smell because they had been out on the streets. And sometimes the saints would turn their noses up on these people. And sometimes they would actually just get up and change seats because they didn't want to be around them. But we have to be careful. Why? Because sometimes we are entertaining angels <laughs> unaware. You don't know who that person is. You don't know what that person is going through. You don't know what power and anointing that person has. You don't know if God's hand is upon you. If God is testing you to see how you will treat the least of them. Ha, hallelujah. The Lord might send a word through one of them. There's been many people in the Bible that had flaws. Many people that were imperfect. Look at Samson and, and look at Moses and look at David. All of these men of God, they had imperfections, but God found some kind of way to use them. In Hebrews 13 and 2, it says, don't neglect to show hospitality. Don't neglect it for doing so. This some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. You might have invited someone to church and they were sitting next to you and you didn't know that this person was sent by God and he just wanted to see how you're going to treat them. He just wanted to see how you're going to act towards them. That's what the Bible says. You might be entertaining angels and don't even know about it. And here you are with a nasty attitude next to an angel. Oh, I wish I could preach here. I we should not think that Lazarus was saved by his poverty or because he was poor any more than thinking that the rich man went to hell because of his wealth. Oh, Lazarus wasn't saved just because he was in poverty. It didn't say that. Lazarus wasn't saved just because he was a beggar. But Lazarus had something that the rich man didn't have. He had a relationship with God. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and he had a true relationship of faith. And the rich man didn't. As a matter of fact, the rich man mentioned the word later on when he was talking about his brothers. Because it came to the realization. It came to him why he was in the position that he was in. He said, Lord, if you would just send somebody, because maybe they will, what, that one word. He said, maybe they might repent. Because I found myself in this situation because I haven't repented. I've held on to all of these things, all of the hatred and the anger, all of these things. I've never told this person that I was sorry for what I said about them. I never told my husband that I stepped out on them. I never told my wife that I stepped out on them. I never told my family that I'm an alcoholic in secret. I never repented of the hidden things. See, those are the things that keep us from God. It's the hidden things. Oh, we look good on Sunday. We look good on Sunday. But it's some things that we all go through. It's some challenges that we all face. Lazarus had a relationship. But see, Lazarus did not allow his condition to affect his trust and belief in God. See, we're living in the day and time. Let's just be honest. People praise the Lord depending on how they feel when they come in on Sunday morning. I mean, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I see it. I'm, I'm up here. Come on, praise the Lord. Okay, let's jump out. Let's give God the praise. Come on. We got to hype some people to give God the glory. How are we hyping people to give the creator of the universe all of the praise that he desires? Uh, I, I might come to church. You know, I'm going to do God a favor and just show up. I, I might get up and say something. I might just sit on my hands the whole time because what the preacher is saying, it, it really doesn't apply to me because I'm just living this perfect life. We miss church because I can't get my hair done. I, I couldn't get my suit. I'll just watch it online now. That's the big thing now. Just watch church online. 
where the Bible talks about gathering ourselves together, united together. We find strength in the sanctuary. We don't find strength on YouTube. We don't find strength on YouTube. See, we allow our situations to dictate our relationship with God. Lazarus was a beggar, a beggar, but so much so that he had sores all over his body. Lazarus desired to eat the dirty bread. He just didn't want regular bread. Do you realize back in those days, I've said this before, it was Jewish custom. They took bread and they broke it. And what they did was they cleaned their hands with the bread. So they took clean bread and they dirtied it up. So when they were ready to eat, they took the dirty bread and threw it on the ground. And so Lazarus didn't want the clean bread. He just wanted the bread that you threw on the ground. But it didn't stop him from believing and trusting in God. See, we got to get to a point where we stop letting people keep you away from your relationship with God. No matter what condition you find yourself in, people are talking to you and talking to you about not serving God. Oh, you don't need to do all that. They got folks to do that. Oh, you don't have to be involved with all of that. Oh, I'm not doing all that. I just come to church and pay my tithe. No, no, it's more than just coming to church. Do we understand that? Are we getting what God is saying? It's more than just coming to church. In Philippians 4 and 11, in the CSB version, Paul says, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether in abundance or in need. He said, I am able to do all three things through him who strengthens me. Who is him? It's Christ. No matter your status, no matter your struggle, no matter your temptation, no matter your tribulation, no matter your heartache, your fear, your doubt, whatever it is you are going through, you can do all things. He didn't say, I can't do this. He said, I can do all things. Everything through Christ that strengthens me. In all of my tests, in all of my sickness, in all of my struggle, in all of my heartache, in all of my pain, when they walked out on me, I don't have friends like I used to, but I can still do all things. Paul implored and said, man, I can do all things. And as a matter of fact, I've learned to be content with what I have. I don't need a whole lot. But if I do have a whole lot, thank you, God. If I have a little, thank you, Jesus. But I'm content with what God has given me. Because when I don't have it, even though I don't have it, I know I can do all things through him. They look down upon Lazarus. But in the end, the angels carried him away. Some kind of way, Lazarus must have been listening to Moses and the prophets. Somewhere in his, his sickness, somewhere in his hunger, somewhere in his destitute, Somewhere when they laid him at the gates and the dogs came upon him. Somehow in his situation, he never looked at how bad he was because he trusted in Moses and the prophets. And that's all that he had. He had, he had Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. He had the major prophets. He had the minor prophets. He had them. He had Nehemiah. He had Isaiah. He had Ezekiel. He had Daniel. He had the books, the poetry books. He had the minor prophets. He had Obadiah. But he had something that the rich man didn't have, and that was a relationship with God. He was poor, yeah. He was a beggar, yeah. He was sick, yeah, 
But he still had a relationship. He didn't let his situation stop him from going to church. He didn't let his situation stop him from making it to the synagogue. He didn't have excuses. God don't take people to heaven that's got excuses. I know that went over. Okay, y'all. It's no excuses. When we look at this parable, there's just so much to uncover, and I'm, I'm almost done. What is interesting is that Luke never calls this a parable as he designates the other 13 parables that he has in his book. Jesus would say, and he would speak a parable unto them in, in Luke 6 and 39. He said, can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not fall into the ditch? In Luke 19 and 11, all of these parables, but this didn't say it was a parable. In Luke 18 and 1, he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to what? Always pray and not faint. As a matter of fact, this is narrated like a real story. And we have to believe it because Jesus said, I am Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the author and finisher of your faith. So if you find yourself in a situation that you're not normally used to, it is God who has wrote your script. It is not what man has done. It is what God has done. If you are a believer and you you study God's word, once a person passes over from this life of probation, and this is where we are, we're in a life of probation. We're on probation right now because at the end, we're going to get graded. He's Jesus, they're just like a teacher. We're going to come before them and they're going to open up some books. And they're going to look at the books. And they're going to see what you did and what you didn't do. It's no excuses. It's no such thing as a do-over. It's no such thing as, wait a minute, Lord, let me go back and give me another chance to say that I'm sorry. It's not another chance to be nice to people. It's not another chance to to not be a racist towards people. You don't get an opportunity to do this life over again. It's appointed unto man to die once. You get one chance at this, saints. One chance. But after that, it's the judgment. After that, I know that it, it seems harsh. But the Lord was showing me that it's more to it than what you're seeing. The rich man said to him, he said, listen, Father Abraham. And we knew that we know that the rich man was Jewish because he called him Father Abraham. And where do we see that? Look at John 8 and 39. And they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. We know that he was Jewish. By the way that he addressed him. But there's something else that that I want to focus on. And that is, are you really persuaded? Because he wasn't persuaded by Moses and the prophets. And we're living in a day and time where people don't appear to be persuaded by the word of God. It's something about the word. I, I, I don't believe in all of that. We hear people saying that all the time. See, the rich man wanted someone to, from the grave to bear witness of where he was. But you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is showing us the weakness of trusting in signs and using signs to compel people to faith or belief. If somebody comes from the dead, I'll believe, but only for a certain amount of time. Okay, well, let's look at what the word says. Let's look at John 12 and 9. John 12 and 9. It said, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. In 12 and 10, but the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, Many of the Jews went away and started believing on Jesus. But why did they believe on Jesus? Because of the sign. They didn't have faith, but they saw the sign. They saw the fact that Lazarus 
was raised from the dead. So I, I trust in you, God, but I see the sign. I have faith in you, Lord, but I see this sign. But Jesus has said, and, and when he told the rich man, it, it, a, a dead man can't persuade you with the word of God. Because of the reason many of the Jews started de deserting and believing in Jesus, and then the chief priest got mad. Hey, wait a minute, y'all leaving the synagogue. You leaving church because you believe in what Jesus says. It's just like with your friends, man. You used to hang out with us all night. Now you're going to church all the time because you believe in what Jesus said. Now you, you, you believe in what God's word said. Come on, get some of this 40 ounce. No, I believe in what Jesus said. Ha, hallelujah. They were believing in Jesus because Lazarus was resurrected from the dead. It wasn't because that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They were persuaded by the signs. And that's what God is trying to tell us. You're persuaded by the signs instead of having faith that God is he who he says that he is. Look at John 18 and 18. It says, for this cause, the people also met him. For they heard that he had done this miracle. In verse 18 to 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled with spake, Lord, who have believed our report? And whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? They were unable to believe because they were blinded. And because their hearts are hardened. And we're living in a day and time. We're living in a generation where people's hearts are become hardened towards the word of God. It's hard to talk to them about God and who God is. It's hard for them to believe in God's promises. It's hard for them to trust and have faith. It's almost like you got to take a sledgehammer and open up the word and say, this is what the word of God says. But they were blinded. They believed in the sign. They were persuaded by the sign. The rich man says, send a dead man. Then my brothers will repent. But Abraham said, man, a dead man won't make folks believe. Isn't that something? A dead man will not make people believe in God. We're living in a day and time. Where the dead won't even have you believing that God exists. Even Jesus coming back from the cross. Even the fact that he was raised from the dead. We just celebrated resurrection. The greatest day ever for Christians. A resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. Because if it had not been for Jesus getting up out of that grave, you and I would find ourselves in a whole world of trouble. You have to have faith. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 and 18 as I rush to a close. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Would you look at that? But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of Jesus on the cross is foolishness to people. But to us, to me, it's the power of God. To every believer, it's the power of God. To every Christian, it's the power of God. For the Jews, here it is right here in verse 22. It says, for the Jews require what? They need to see somebody come from the dead. I need a sign. I need you to send somebody from the dead. I need a sign. I don't believe in all that, preacher. I need to see somebody come from the dead before I believe. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. This day and time, people are so philosophical. They're so smart about the word, and they try to, man, it's something about Jesus. It's something about the word of God. When I was lost, he found me. He changed my life, and now I'm free. That's a song, amen? I was a different person when he first met me, but now he changed my life. 
The word says, but we preach Christ crucified. But unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, what it is, is foolishness. You know why they thought it was a stumbling block? Because how could something that hung on a cross, that was supposed to be accursed. How can that be our savior? How can that be our deliverer? How can that be our redeemer? How can that be our strength, our shield, our hope? How can our hope be found in someone hanging on a cross? They needed a sign. And the cross was a stumbling block unto them. In Romans 10 and 17, how do we get to where we at? The word says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Are you hearing what God is saying? Stop looking for the sign and stop believing in the word. We're looking for signs and the word is right here in front of us. It's telling us how to live. It's telling us follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's telling us how to make it into heaven. We often talked about uh, the man in, 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 in hell. But it's more to that. It's more to that story. People are looking for a sign. And Jesus is right there in front of you. He's beckoning this world to get saved, to get delivered. He's calling people out of darkness. It's time to go find people and witness and tell them about the goodness of the Lord. How good he's been. How such a deliverer he's been. He's been my hope. He's been my shield. Everything that he said he was, that's what he's been. My last verse, it said, and when they had pointed him a day. This is Acts 28 and 23. There came many into his lodging, talking about Paul, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. And what did he do? Persuading them concerning Jesus. Are you persuaded concerning Jesus? That's the question that I'm asking. Are you persuaded? Both out of the law and what? Out of the prophets. From morning till evening. You know what that shows? It shows the importance still to Paul of Moses and the prophets. But he preached Jesus also. But look at verse 28 and 24 as I closed. Some were persuaded by what he said. And others did not believe. Others did not believe. I don't care what you say, preacher. I don't believe what you're saying. It's a sad predicament. The rich man found himself in hell because he didn't repent, not because he wasn't rich, because he turned his back on a poor man. He didn't repent, and he asked, send somebody for my brothers so that they don't find themselves in the same place that I am. And I came to tell you, are you persuaded that Jesus is who he said he is in your life? Because if he is, you will live like he is. Father, in the name of Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. I'm persuaded, God. I'm convinced that you are God. You are Lord above all. You are our strength. I'm persuaded, God. You don't have to beat me over the head with a hammer. I believe and trust in you. Father, when I was down, when I had nothing, God, it was you who kept me. You kept my family. You keep my church family, God. You keep the saints of God. Lord, wrap your arms around us, God. Lord, help us to be persuaded to do your will. Not just to come to church, God. Help us to see that it's more than just that. It's more than just a sign. I'm persuaded to follow you. I'm persuaded to run after you. Lord, I'm running this race until the very end. Lord God, don't let me fall, God. Now unto him, he's able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. 
to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forevermore. Amen. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519, Harris Memorial Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love.